Our first project is going to be a SIM card reader. But before we dive into that, it's useful to know all sorts of information about SIM cards, like how to interface with them and what sort of data we can get out of a SIM card. So let's begin with the fundamentals. What is a SIM card and how does it interact with the GSM network? So let's go to the workbench. GSM, or Global System for Mobile Communication, originally called Group Especial Mobile, is kind of interesting. It covers 82% of the world, it has about 3 billion people using it, and it operates in about 212 countries. Now, uh, if you take a normal GSM phone, one of the things you'll notice if you pop off the battery or look on the side, you'll see a SIM card, and these things pop out pretty easily. SIM stands for Subscriber Identity Module. This is this little guy here with some contacts and then usually a logo on the other side. Now, all the really important information about an account user is stored on this card, like um, the phone number, the carrier, and you know the account number, stuff like that. There's some other information stored on the SIM card, like uh, SMSs, uh, phone books, and sometimes the last phone number is dialed. This means that upgrading a phone is really easy. Just pop out and swap out SIM cards. It's sort of like a SD card that you see in a digital camera or an MP3 player, but this one has a little tiny microcontroller, and this microcontroller can control what goes in and out of the card and to the phone and to the network, and also the secret key. Before the cell phone can make a phone call, it has to be authenticated. Authentication works in a challenge response scheme. Basically what that means is when the phone is turned on, it asks a SIM card for the unique identifier associated with this card, and that's the account number. It then contacts the carrier through the cell tower and says, hey, please authenticate me. The carrier, which knows the account number, looks up a secret authentication code. That's the code that's stored in here that we can't get to. It then generates a random number and sends it back to the phone and says, please encrypt this random number with a secret key code. Now, the phone doesn't know what the secret key code is, but it can ask the SIM card to please encrypt this random number. So it takes that random number generated by the carrier, gets it encrypted by the SIM card, and then sends that response back. Since the carrier knows both the identifier and the secret key code, same as a SIM card, it can verify that the SIM card is the correct one. The phone's authenticated, it can make a phone call. Now, what if you had two SIM cards and they had the same unique identifier as well as the same secret authentication code? Well, basically that means that the two phones using these SIM cards could both authenticate themselves and make phone calls, basically using two phones on one account. And that's called SIM cloning. Now to clone the card, you need the unique identifier and the secret key code. The unique identifier is easy to get, you just ask the SIM for it. The secret key code won't give up. So how to get it out? Well, it turns out that in older SIM cards, there was a small problem with the encryption process. It wasn't really perfect. And it's susceptible to a brute force attack. What does that mean? Basically, instead of connecting the SIM card to a phone, connect the SIM card to a computer. The computer then asks the SIM card to encrypt 150,000 different messages that are specially chosen and analyzes the responses. By analyzing the responses, it can deduce the secret key code. So I've got all my tools set up here. I've got my multimeter, my trusty multimeter, which will be used for testing the circuit. Uh, the fume sucker, which will be used to get rid of all the fumes from soldering. And my soldering iron. Uh, I also have a nice vise for holding the circuit board while I work on it. This is really useful, but you can use um, a third-hand tool as well. So there's three parts of a SIM card reader. There's the power supply section, there's the oscillator section, and then there's the serial port and card interface section. So for the power supply, you'll need a 9-volt battery and a 9-volt battery holder. So we connect the battery up to the circuit board. A 1N4001 protection diode and a 7805. 7805s come in two varieties, a mini version and big brother version. You can use either one. The power supply should also have an LED that'll indicate when the device is on. So an LED and a 1K resistor. And then to keep the power supply uh, functioning well, a bypass capac capacitor is necessary. Uh, this one is a 100 microfarad capacitor, and this is a small ceramic capacitor. The second part of the circuit that we're going to build is the oscillator section. That's the part that generates the 3.57 megahertz signal that's sent to the SIM card. That lets it run at the correct baud rate. You'll need a 3.57 megahertz crystal, two 20 picofarad capacitors, a 1 mega ohm resistor, a 2K resistor, and a 74HC04 NOT gate. You can also get a socket to put the gate into, makes it fit nicely. The third part of the circuitry is the serial port and SIM card interface. Now the most important part here is to get 
a good SIM card holder. This allows you to put the SIM card in and lock it so you can create a good connection with it. And a female DB9 serial port connector. This is what you'll be able to connect to the computer. You also need two Zener diodes. Anywhere between 3.6 to 6 volt is perfectly fine and three 10K resistors. This part is what allows a 10 volt serial port to contact with a five volt SIM card reader um, safely. You also need an NPN transistor, any kind will do. A SIM card has a bunch of contacts on the bottom that allows the SIM card reader to talk to it. Now there's eight or nine or 10 contacts here, but only the six middle ones are really important. This is what the SIM card looks like on the bottom. Now there's the six contacts and in the middle there's one big contact and that one big contact is connected to one of the side ones. That's the ground contact. That's used for power and signal ground. Underneath that is the programming pin contact. That's used by the manufacturer to program the SIM card when it comes out of the factory. We won't be using that pin though. We'll be using the serial I.O. pin that's right beneath that. That's how the computer talks to the SIM card. On the other side is the clock pin. That's where the reader sends a clock signal to the SIM card chip to tell it what the correct baud rate is. Make sure to be using a 3.57 megahertz clock, which translate to a 9600 baud signal. Above that is the reset pin. That's how the reader says, hey, wake up, we're ready to talk to you. And above that is the 5 volt pin. That's how you send power to the SIM card. cell phone and remove the SIM card and put the phone to the side. Now turn over the SIM card reader and slide in the SIM card so that it locks in. Plug in the 9 volt battery. The green LED should be lit. Now connect up the serial port. Let's run the software. Select the serial port that the SIM card reader is connected to. For Windows, it's probably something like COM port 1. First thing we'll do is extract the saved SMSs from the SIM card. Now, some phones don't overwrite old SIMs with zeros or FF, so you can actually extract deleted SMSs and undelete them. Uh, every SMS message has the recipient, the sender, the message, and a timestamp so you can see when it was received. Next we'll read the last dial numbers. These are the last 10 numbers that the cell phone tried to call. Next we'll read the phone book. Now this is all the contact and phone number information that's stored on the SIM card. Sometimes this is used as a backup and sometimes it's the primary phone book. Now it takes a long time to read the phone book because there's 250 entries in this SIM card for contact data. Each contact has a name and a phone number. Finally, we're going to look up the SIM information. Now, this is sort of low-level information, the serial number, the last location the phone was used in, pin statistics, stuff like that. When you're done, you can just disconnect the reader. 
Finally, if you're interested in the low-level protocol data, you should look through the debug window where you can see what kind of information was sent and received from the SIM card. Now, let's say you wanted to clone a SIM card. Well, there's no way the SIM card is going to give up the unique identifier and the secret key. But what you can do is perform a known plain text attack, and that'll hit the SIM card tens of thousands of times using software, which I have running here. And if it works out, you get the key. But uh, most SIMs, it doesn't work on any longer, and also it can disable some SIMs. So uh, we're going to run the software. It takes about six hours, so uh, let's give it a whirl. All right, so let's see how we made out. Looks like that we uh, were able to correct the SIM card. Now all we would need to do is copy this information to a writable SIM. This project is done. Due to various technological, social, and legislative changes, payphones are being phased out. That means it's never been easier to get a payphone. This is a Western Electric 1C2 payphone. It's a little bit older, but pretty much any telco-owned payphone is going to look similar. Uh, what you want to look for is bell logos, bell names, anything that says, you know, the local telephone company on it. Every brand of payphone has its own T key that's used to open it up. Put it in the side and turn. Go move the handset and pull the front off. Be careful because inside there's a plug from both halves. Connecting up a payphone for home use is pretty easy. First you'll need a telephone wire that has telephone spade lugs on one end and standard screwdriver. Feed the telephone spade lugs through the back of the phone. Then connect the red wire, which is the ring to this terminal block marked R. Second, connect the green spade lug, which is the tip, to the terminal block marked T. Finally, take the black and yellow wire, which are not going to be used, and tie them to the ground connector. Coin counting circuitry has to be jumpered so that the phone doesn't expect a coin to be inserted before it can make a call. Now that's actually already been done here by jumpering pin 5 and pin 8 on this plug. Otherwise you can just solder a piece of wire in to connect the two. Now simply plug the payphone into your home phone line, or in this case, a VoIP box. Now's a good time to test the wiring. It's pretty easy. Just call the phone from another line. There are many distinct parts to a payphone. On the left, there's the coin sorting mechanism, which detects valid currency. And then below that is the coin hopper. That's where coins are stored while the payphone makes a phone call. And then this is the coin relay. This controls whether coins in the hopper go into the coin box or into the return chute. On the right side, there's the bell, the phone line terminal block, the coin tone oscillator, and the connectors and jumpers for the two halves of the payphone. Here's where the totalizer would live. Now, unfortunately, the totalizer was ripped out of this payphone before we procured it. On the other half of the payphone, there's the handset switch hook detector, the tone pad, which is on the back, and the DTMF encoder and terminal block. To remove the coin assembly, first flip this latch, then reach in and push on the wire ring, and this part just comes out. To open up the coin assembly, just flip it open, and then these magnets also flip open. When a coin is inserted into the payphone, it travels down this chute. Now in this case, a quarter will pass by the quarter separator. Only if it's the correct size and weight will it rotate the separator and cause it to pass past this magnet. This magnet sets up an eddy current inside the conductive metal of the coin, which causes it to slow down a little bit and bypass this chute and continue into this one, where the coin is accepted. 
The coin then drops into the hopper, where the payphone waits until the switch tells it whether to put the coin in the coin box or return it into the return chute. Now this payphone is ready to make phone calls from home, but that's not really much fun. What I want to do is modify this payphone so it requires coins to make a phone call. Since there's no totalizer, I'm going to have to add a sensor to detect coins. I'm going to put one here on this little flapper. The sensor I'm going to use is a brake beam sensor. There's an emitter and a detector, and when an object goes in between, the sensor goes off. Cut a flap out of a piece of card. The flap will be glued onto the hopper trigger right here. Glue the flap onto the hopper trigger. The first part is the power supply. So this is the coin detector and phone controller that we started with. Um, as a power supply, I'm using four AA batteries connected to the battery pack. Um, this is the power supply, so just a capacitor just to regulate the power and a little indicator LED to tell me it's on. Um, then I've hooked up the um, sensor that will detect when a coin has gone down the slot. Uh, that's connected to a latch which will take the small pulse that comes from the sensor and convert it into a steady voltage, which then controls a telecom relay. That's a relay that's specifically designed to control um, the high telecom voltages, and it'll work off of 5 volts. That's perfect. So, testing the sensor by putting a card in front. Now I'm going to glue the sensor into the payphone. And now I'm going to glue the other side of the sensor. Make two wires with spade lugs on the end. Connect one of the spade lugs to the phone line ring and the other spade lug to the payphone ring. Now plug in those two jumper wires into the relay. Now clip the coin relay open. Now it's time to test our system. Turn on the battery pack and pick up the phone. There won't be a dial tone. Now Press on the coin hopper trigger so that the sensor is broken and you'll hear a dial tone. Now I'm going to put the payphone back together, insert the coin validator, close it up. Now nobody can make a phone call on my Skype payphone unless they put in a quarter. Now put in the coin validator. Make sure to be careful of the sensor you placed in. Finally, wire up a bump sensor between the power from the battery pack and the circuit board so when the switch is depressed, power to the board gets cut. Glue the sensor so when the phone is on hook, the switch is depressed. To make wiring easier, I'm going to crimp on some lugs onto the switch contacts. Thread these wires through the small hole in the payphone bottom. and thread the power connector up. This payphone didn't come with a coin box, so I'm going to use a blue cup instead. Just put it in the back. Finally, stash the power supply and the circuit board right in front. Put the front of the coin box in. Unlock it again with the T key. Slide it on. And lock. Now close up the payphone. Oops. Shit. No dial tone. Insert a quarter. Now I got a dial tone. Can make a phone call. This project is done. 
So my pay payphone project works pretty well, but I want to add a little bit of old school charm to it. Instead of the coin going directly into the coin box when you put it in, I want it to sit in the hopper. And then when the phone is hung up, the coin relay will activate and the coin will drop into the coin box, making that nice chink sound. Time to crack open the payphone again. This is that coin relay that we clipped open. Now, I'm going to unclip it. To actually this relay, I need 130 volts, but I don't really have 130 volts kicking around here because it isn't hooked up to a payphone phone line. The phone line can generate 48 volts, but it doesn't have enough current to drive the relay, so I'm going to have to build my own DC power supply from the battery pack in the coin box. First thing I'll do is build the high voltage power supply. <laughs> basic DC-DC boost converter based on the LT1073 chip. This chip actually does almost all of the work. All that's required is an inductor, a shock key diode, and some capacitors for the input and output, and resistors to set the output voltage. The input battery pack power comes in here, and the output 30 volts comes out of these screen wires. Before wiring this up to our existing circuit, I'm going to test the voltage, just measure with a multimeter the voltage with, between the two green wires. Should be around 30 volts. Now's a good time to test the DC-DC boost converter. Um, connect up the converter to the switch so that it's only powered when the phone is on hook. Uh, remove the spring from the coin relay, and then try testing the two, two prongs to the coin relay and make sure it activates. Plug in the power so it's only activated when the phone is on hook. Remove the coin relay return spring. This will make it easier to activate with lower voltages. With the coin in the hopper, connect the 30 volts output to the two connectors for the relay, G and this three here. The relay should activate. Once it's been verified to work, attach the prongs permanently. Connecting them one way makes the coin go into the coin box. Connected the other way, the coins will go into the return chute. One of the nice things about the Western Electric payphone designs is that there's a little read relay right where the coin detector is. That means that once the coin relay activates, this disconnects and the relay automatically opens. I'm going to cut this board down a little bit. This will make it fit nicer. And I can use the extra scrap for another project. Then put the circuit board in a little baggie. This will protect the high voltages from touching some other part of the other circuit board. Okay, put everything back in the coin box, and we're going to close up the payphone and test this last mod. Time to try it out. Pick up the handset and deposit a coin. Now the coin is in the hopper. Hang up. The coin will be deposited in the coin box. So I've got this payphone. It's been modified for home use. And I've taken it and reverse engineered it and made it so that it now requires coins to make a phone call. And I've also added the coin hopper and coin relay activation. But there's one more hack I want to do on this phone. But before I get into that, it's important to understand how these dumb payphones keep track of how much money's been inserted. In this payphone, the totalizer has been taken out. It normally sits here, and it has little arms that stick into the coin validator so that when a coin falls through, it triggers and sets off the coin tone oscillator, this pink box here. The coin oscillator is a passive oscillator that generates 2200 hertz and 1700 hertz. You can trigger the coin tone oscillator pretty easily. Connect one diode to pin seven, and another diode to pin 4 of J2. Clip pin 7 to the tip and pin 4 to the ring. Now when a quarter is inserted into this payphone, the totalizer detects that and it triggers the coin tone oscillator for a quarter. It triggers it five times. Now, Shit. 
that tone goes down the phone line is detected by the switch on the other side. The switch looks up the current call rates and determines how much money has been deposited and how much money is owed and asks the user to please deposit more money if necessary. In the late 80s, some clever person either read the Bell Systems Manual or deduced how payphones work from observation and determined that if you played those 2200 plus 1700 hertz tones into the microphone, it would go down the phone line and the switch on the other side would be fooled into thinking the totalizer and coin tone oscillator made those tones and thus was red boxing born. Red boxing became much more popular when it was noticed that the dual tone multifrequencies from the coin tone oscillator are directly proportional to the tones generated when you hit the star key on a phone. And those tones are directly proportional to whatever crystal oscillator is driving the DTMF encoder chip. So to make these special coin oscillator tones, you don't need a coin tone oscillator box. You could just use a DTMF generator, like this old Radio Shack tone dialer. This one's 16 years old. All you have to do is change the crystal. So open it up and swap out the old crystal for this, a 6.5536 megahertz crystal. Now the dialer will emit the same tones necessary when you hit the star key. Now, due to various anti-fraud measures, the emergence of code cuts, and AT&T discontinuing their payphone line service, red boxing is a rarity. It's pretty much impossible to do anymore. That's a real shame, because I've got one of these red boxes and I'd really like to use it. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to modify this payphone so that I can red box out instead of putting coins in. So now I have to build a circuit that detects when red box tones have been played into the microphone of the handset. To do that, I'm going to use a DTMF decoder chip. These are the chips that were used in you know, old voicemail systems, like pressing one or two or three would you know, open a mailbox or close it. I'm going to use this chip, but instead of using the crystal that's supposed to be used with it, I'm going to change it to a different crystal. This is the same one used to hack red boxes. So now both of them are listening for the same frequency tones. Now all to do is detect one of the star keys pressed. That's the same as a red box tone. <laughs> Okay, now's a good time to test the red box tone detector. Here's the circuitry for the red box detector. Now I've got the DTMF decoder with the new crystal so it can detect red box tones. And I've got this selector latch, and that will make sure that only when the star key is pressed will the latch go high. And here's a little indicator LED. This will blink when it detects a red box tone. That's very useful for debugging. To connect up to the handset and listen to the audio coming in from the microphone, I'm going to jack it into this terminal block. Now, this is the reference ground, number 11, and this red wire is from the handset, and that comes from the microphone, so that's going to be our audio input. I've disconnected the ring line from our relay and jumpered it just so we can do this test without having to worry about the relay turning on and off. Okay. Pick up the handset, and there'll be a dial tone, and you'll see that this board is lit, but the green LED is not on. Now, red box. And you'll see that the green LED lights up because it detected the star. So, test our system. system seems to work, but there's one problem. Now, because the payphone is designed to be coined first, that is, we don't connect the phone line until we get money or a red box signal, there's no power to the microphone, so the circuit can't actually listen in on the microphone because there's no power. But we're going to solve this pretty easily by biasing the handset ourselves by using a 5-volt power supply. Luckily, the internal power supply for the handset is supposed to be 5 volts, so it's kind of a lucky coincidence. First, I'll connect my audio input to the circuit. That'll come from here, the handset ring. Now I'll connect the ground reference prong that goes up here. Now I'm going to connect the bias power to the handset. That goes into the handset tip. Now this telecom relay is a double throw. That means there's actually two switches inside. And I'm going to use that second switch to connect and disconnect that bias power. So only when we don't have the phone line connected here will there be power to the handset. This way, our 5 volts won't compete with the phone line 5 volts. One more thing to do, and that's close up the payphone. OK, project's done, and I'm ready to use it. Pick up the phone, no dial tone, get my handy red box. Now I'm ready to call some comps.